This semester's um, Jindal lecturer is the eminent historian, uh, Nain Jyot Lahiri. She's a professor of history at Ashoka University, a new university in India, new and rising, and being, uh, a university being widely noted. Um, and before that, she was for many, many years a uh, professor at the University of Delhi, where she also um, taught um, at the Hindu College before joining the Department of History and was educated uh, there as well at St. Stephen's uh, College. Um, she, was, uh, she served as member of Delhi Urban Art Commission for some years and currently serves on the Council of Indian Council of Social Science Research, ICSSR, and the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library Society these are two of the um, uh, two of the highest institutions of uh, for research uh, in India. Um, those of you who don't know um, uh, that world, uh, she was a member of the committee that's uh, set up by the government of India in 2010 to analyze the impact of the ancient monuments and archaeological sites and remains. Ordinance. It was an ordinance till 2010. She helped draft an alternative bill for parliament, which became law in March 2010. Professor Lahiri's uh, research interests uh, include ancient India, Indian archaeology, and heritage studies. She is the author, among other books, of um, The Archaeology of Indian Trade, Trade Routes. Finding Forgotten Cities, How the Indus Civilization Was Discovered, Marshalling the Past, Ancient India and Its Modern Histories, and Ashoka in Ancient India, was published in 2015. Professor Lahiri won the prestigious Infosys Prize in 2013 in the Humanities Archaeology section, and her book, Ashoka in Ancient India, was awarded the 2016 John F. Richards Prize by the American Historical Association for the best book in South Asian history. Her topic is, are archaeological discoveries like scientific discoveries, the curious case of the Indus civilization? Uh, the format is as follows. She'll speak to us for 40 to 45 minutes. And then we have two discussants, uh, whom I'll introduce later. They'll speak for 10 to 15 minutes each. We'll then open up for a general discussion. Please welcome Professor Nain Jyot Lahiri. Thank you, Ashutosh, for that introduction. So when Ashutosh Vashne invited me to deliver the O.P. Jindal lectures, uh, it was a wonderful opportunity because I've never been to Brown. So I've been a long admirer of the scholarship that has emanated from Brown University. But this made possible my visit to the university. He, of course, had only one statutory limitation, and that was that I had to speak about modern and contemporary times. So uh, I'm going to speak about the discovery of the Indus civilization, a discovery which was announced as recently as uh, 1924. You know, when you think back to uh, Mesopotamia and Egypt and so on and so forth, you're looking at, relatively speaking, a longer chronology. <clears throat> of course, right at the outset, I want to say that even uh, though it was such a recent discovery, very quickly in India, it became an integral part of the way people visualized themselves. So it's not a part of the dead past. It's very much. Uh, integral to the living present. There are novels written around the Indus civilization, poems, uh, films, and occasionally uh, the Indus civilization is also invoked in public policy. 
<clears throat> so I'm going to begin actually by showing you a clip from a Tamil film. Uh, it was made some years ago. Uh, it's called Hey Ram, and uh, it's set in 1947, which was, of course, a time of great turmoil and trauma and communal tension uh, with the impending partition. Now, the protagonist of this film, a man called Saket Ram, is actually an archaeologist who is digging in Mohenjo-daro at this point in time, the iconic uh, in the city in the Sindh. And he's working under the guidance of Sir Mortimer Wheeler, uh, you know, who is, of course, a, a real historical uh, figure. This is a double burial site, all right? Yes, like the Lothal one. One burial and two burial. <laughs> yes, Mr. Wheeler. We have been ordered to leave this site. And uh, why may I ask, sir? <laughs> what is it this time, sir? Broadly, Pakistan. Oh. Mm. All right, Mr. Wheeler. Damn, Amjad. Poor Amjad. We have to leave. Yeah. Communal rights, Parisa, Varun, Edir, Var, Karala. We have to go to Karachi. No. No way. No right is going to make me leave my grave. Exactly. <laughs> We don't want it to become your grave, Mr. Amjad Khan. We are leaving. It's serious. I'll give you one hour to pack up and to safeguard what has been excavated. Come on! Come on! Jaldi, jaldi, chalo! Come on! Come on! It's pack up time now! Yes, Mr. Wheeler! Yes, sir! Okay, okay, Patan. Control your temper. Aiyah, ira wacma ingga dana erke. Ingga boda purde. Turumbu orang mau. Christ perakatte ke pala ira wacma monna lah. Sewage system windom ni nenece civilisation. Koran dengga vali ada bumbu windom ni nenece civilisation. Nampra madri peri evangga vali ada. Aado kur sami windom ni nenekre civilisation illa. Sari da pa. Nama erker da anda civilisation illiye. Nama er. Yes, Mr. Wheeler. So actually what's really struck me about uh, the clip was the fact that the standard for what was civilized in India, you know, was the Indus civilization and it was just juxtaposed so interestingly with the uh, terrible situation of 1947. Now that of course is 1947 and I'm now going to take you back to 1924 when the uh, discovery of the Indus civilization was announced on 20th September 1924 in the Illustrated London News. It was announced by the scholar archeologist John Marshall. Uh, this announcement and its aftermath dramatically altered existing perceptions uh, of India's civilizational antiquity by actually pushing it back to the third millennium BCE. Marshall's news, in fact, conveyed one of the most monumental discoveries in the history of civilization, something which is actually comparable to the discovery of Minoan Crete, for instance. Uh, and, uh, of course, the process itself, the you know, goes back to about the middle of the 19th century. But what I'm going to do here is to really talk about the 20th century episodes relating to this discovery. Uh, in my book, Finding Forgotten Cities, I've actually provided a full narrative history about how the civilization was unearthed. Uh, actually, this book did not begin as a narrative about the Indus civilization. It was intended to be an intellectual biography of John Marshall himself in the life and times genre. 
However, because of a treasure trove that I discovered in the form of files uh, in the archaeological survey file room, uh, I came upon a great deal that was unknown about the discovery of the Indus. I also came face to face with the ideas of some of the well-known archaeologists, but also many lesser known ones as they grappled with what was emerging from the ruins of cities like Mohenjo-daro and Harappa. But here, of course, I'm going to try and do something different. I re-examine that story which I unearthed in order to understand how the process of discovery of India's Bronze Age civilization can actually be juxtaposed with the literature on scientific discoveries. Uh, first of all, of course, before going into the nitty gritties of this discovery, I just want to point out that the direction of the Indus discovery is different from most other discoveries in the sense that uh, there are many discoveries which are retrospectively told as very neat narratives by their discoverers. But this story cannot actually be written around a hero and someone who always knew what he was about to uncover. In fact, the credit for the discovery of the Indus civilization goes to several archaeologists, most of whom were connected in one way or the other with the Archaeological Survey of India, or the ASI, as we call it, which was, as it still is, a government department. Equally, some of them very unexpectedly and without any planning on their part, discovered clues which would eventually change the way the Indian past was visualized. So I think in some ways this fits in with what histories of science have increasingly revealed, that scientific discoveries are infinitely more haphazard than they actually appear in received accounts of scientific genius. Uh, the second point about this whole story is that there is no received account about how the discovery unfolded. None of these characters who I will talk about penned either retrospective narratives or wrote out their memoirs, uh, nor have any notebooks or diaries been found which, uh, you know, help in revealing the kind of enigma of how this discovery unraveled. Instead, what we have are piles of government files, uh, files which contain the usual run-of-the-mill correspondence exchanged by government officers. So I think these actually have a huge advantage in that they were not produced to provide a very neat ex post facto version of how India's ancient civilizational past was recovered. So using such material, I'm going to try and answer this question. How did this archaeological discovery unfold? And how can it contribute to the larger theoretical literature on the phenomena of discovery, especially patterns pertaining to scientific discoveries? So for instance, I found the idea of the slow hunch as used in exploring patterns of innovation and scientific breakthroughs very useful. Uh, Stephen Johnson, in his bestseller, Where Good Ideas Come From, explores this in some detail. So for example, he talks about the ideas of Joseph Priestley, uh, somebody who in deciding to seal a mint sprig in a glass bottle, which ultimately proved that plants create oxygen, was actually building upon an insight that went back to his boyhood. The young priestly apparently trapped spiders in glass jars in the belief that there was something very interesting in the way that organisms perished when you sealed them in closed vessels uh, something that actually pointed to a larger truth. The important point for him was to keep that hunch alive at the back of his mind, 
which of course eventually bloomed some two decades later after he first began thinking of perished spiders in sealed containers. Now, Priestley's slow building up around an early inkling is actually strongly reminiscent of John Marshall's sense about the possibility of pushing back the antiquity of India. It was an idea that was incubated in his mind for some 22 years or so. Marshall came to India as director general in 1902. He was not even 26 years old. Before that, while preparing for his departure, he had actually looked at many objects of Indian origin in England, including the three British Museum seals of Harappa. Uh, these seals were inscribed in an unknown script. Of course, it's only in 1924 that Marshall would preside over the discovery of the Indus civilization, a discovery which had much to do with the sorts of seals that he had first examined more than 22 years before. So Marshall's, in fact, is a classic case of a slow hunch. Here was an archaeologist who, since the early 1900s, intuitively imagined that there was an unknown canvas which preceded what was then considered to be the beginning of the subcontinent's historical past. And yet, this precognition uh, fructified in a positive sense many decades later. We know about Marshall's intuition because in 1903, he deputed an ASI man called Hiranan Shastri to survey sites in North India which had yielded copper objects in the form of hoards. This is because he thought that such objects belonged, as he said, to an age of bronze, which could be correlated with the time period of the Rigved. As it so happened, nothing was actually unearthed by Hiranand, which would allow Marshall to substantiate this connection. And it's only in 1924 that the reality of a literate Bronze Age was firmly established. But the point is that as early as 1903, the prison through which Marshall viewed the Indian past was one that accommodated the notion of a literate Bronze Age. In the same year, 1903, other clues about an unknown segment of Indian history were unearthed from Baluchistan. These were unearthed by Hughes Buller. Hughes Buller is a name who many modern historians are familiar with because of the fabulous uh, district gazetteers that he wrote for Baluchistan. But very few know that Buller also thought of himself as an amateur archaeologist. And in 1903, you have him writing to John Marshall about the large number of polychrome bowls that a member of his staff, Mirza Sher Muhammad, had found at a place called Nal. So when photographs like this of Nal pottery reached Marshall, he immediately declared that if other objects were discovered, there would be a real possibility of having got back to a date which was as yet unrepresented in the Northwest by uh, any antiquities. Very soon, he feels confident enough to say that these were likely to be uh, allied to Mycenaean pottery of the 8th century BC. Now, retrospectively, I find these very interesting observations. Uh, first, his reaction to link this with the Mediterranean makes sense in terms of his own background. After all, he had received his training in the Mediterranean. Second, although this was not immediately followed up for various reasons, his intuition that Nal would push back the existing chronology of Baluchistan has actually proved to be correct. Nal is today recognized as forming part of the background to the birth of the Indus cities. So it's actually even much older than what Marshall had imagined it to be. 
In fact, after the announcement of 1924, Marshall himself would depute one of his officers to excavate Null in order to understand how it synchronized with the Indus civilization. He must have taken this decision to get Null opened up because of the glimpse that he had had of its pottery uh, more than 20 years before in the autumn of 1903. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that John Marshall's teething years saw the discovery of clues uh, which he was sure were unrepresented in the larger narrative, the received narrative of ancient India. Of course, the clues, it has to be admitted, were not pursued by him with any degree of urgency. The site of Harappa exemplifies this. This is the first photograph that we have of the mounds of Harappa. Uh, it seals, as I told you, he was very familiar with. But eventually, Harappa was only excavated in 1921. Yet, if you look at the ASI files, it's very clear that Harappa was a place which was considered for a dig uh, many years before this 1921 excavation. Marshall had actually begun the procedure of excavation in 1907. Uh, this is after he returned from his long leave in England when he had re-examined the Harappa seals. And by 1908, the deputy commissioner of the Montgomery district, where Harappa was situated, uh, was writing to say that, well, uh, the land could be made available for a little over 4,000 rupees. Now, this translates to less than $100. But this was roughly one fourth of what the government of India usually spent on excavations across India. So before finalizing the purchase, obviously uh, Marshall wanted some kind of archaeological feasibility report to be prepared. So he got three such reports prepared from 1909 till 1914. Uh, this, of course, tells us a great deal about the constraints within which field research had to be undertaken in British India where non-commercial government departments actually worked on very small budgets. In fact, within a couple of years after the 1909 report on Harappa, the Indian government, in order to cut down its spending, recommended abolishing a number of posts, including that of the Director General of the ASI. John Marshall's job was eventually saved because of an active campaign in England, which was spearheaded by two former viceroys, his own guru, Lord Curzon, and the fourth Earl of Minto. So he returned to India and to his old job only in 1912. So the point I'm trying to make is that in, you know, he has this interest in Harappa and its intriguing seals. But this interest faced all kinds of extraneous challenges and constraints. It was not only a question of sustaining his intuition at the back of his mind, as has been the case with scientists pursuing hunches, but doing so in the face of inadequate department budgets and job uncertainty. One reason why Marshall's hunch regarding Harappa reached fruition very much later has to do with constraints like this. That Harappa remained on Marshall's mind, even as circumstances unrelated to archaeology put its excavations on a back burner, can actually be explored a little further. So this brings us to the third report on Harappa in 1914, which was prepared by a very senior officer of the ASI, a man called Harold Hargreaves. Uh, it reveals a plan of action within a specific time frame. Har uh, Harappa was examined by Hargreaves in October 1914. And although he was not very impressed with the mounds, he did recommend excavations. He also took the first photographs of Harappa, including this photograph that you see on the screen. As also these, 
which very clearly showed that what we now recognize to be chalcolithic ring stones were being worshipped at a Pir shrine. And uh, the seals that are so typical of the Harappan civilization were constantly being recovered from there. So following this report, Marshall asked the civil authorities to uh, you know, do the needful purchase the mounds uh, so that excavations could begin in 1915. So all indications were that the excavations of Harappa, which he had first contemplated in 1906, would now finally take place. But again, they did not take place. The reason for this was the Great War, which began in 1914. Uh, its outbreak, as most of you know, led to this massive war effort on the part of British India, uh, something to the tune of 367 million pounds was made available by India for the British war expenditure. And clearly, marshalling resources on this scale uh, resulted, if one may say so, in less money for Marshall. Uh, in the ASI, there was also now a palpable uh, crunch as far as people went. Harold Hargreaves, for instance, uh, decided to go off to the Western Front. And uh, there was a moratorium announced on all fresh excavations because of the cash crunch. So here again, it's a configuration of political events related to a theater of war, which is far removed from India, that actually slows the process for pursuing the clues from Harappa. It was in place of Hargreaves that Dayaram Sahni was brought in, uh, the name that we associate with the crucial excavation of the site. This is Dayaram Sahni when he was made Rai Bahadur Dayaram Sahni, and that's why he's all talked up. Uh, but of course, instead of looking at Sahni's excavations, I just want to stay for a moment with the war years. Because around this time, in adjacent uh, Rajputana, as Rajasthan was then called, another trail becomes visible around this time. It concerns the trail of a scholar of languages from Italy, a man called Luigi Pio Tessitori. Uh, Tessitori was a great uh, Rajputana lover, and he looks like an Italian Rajput in this photograph. So around the time that Hargreaves was surveying Harappa, uh, you had Tessitori spiritedly scouting around uh, the desert states of Jodhpur and Bikaner. It was this Italian who would go on to excavate Kalibanga. Kalibanga is a site we usually associate with ASI excavations immediately post-independence. But actually, the first archaeologist, linguist turned archaeologist to have excavated it was this Italian. Uh, Tessitori, I think, is very important because, of course, his contribution is little known. Uh, but also because it's strongly reminiscent of what has happened often in the sciences, where you can have multiple uh, people working on the same problem and coming up with the same discovery or theory entirely independently. Uh, of course, uh, who the credit goes to uh, depends on a whole lot of other circumstances. So Tessitoris is a case study that illustrates something very similar in the world of archaeological discovery. Now, he was an accomplished linguist. He was deeply interested in West Indian vernaculars, although his degree thesis involved a comparison between the Ramkatha of Valmiki and uh, you know, the work of Goswami Tulsidas. But after his thesis, while he was in Italy, he became deeply interested in getting a job in India. So he was in touch with various authorities. Uh, on the one hand, with Vijay Dharmasuri, uh, this extraordinary Jain Acharya, who was very well known to European language scholars. And on the other hand, with the India office, hoping that they would get him a job as a teacher of either Latin or Greek or Italian in a college or school nearest to Rajputana. With uh, Vijay Dharamsuri, uh, 
Tessitori would subsequently build up a very close relationship. He considered him to be his Param Pooja guru. He also later wrote his biography, and through him, he actually got a direct insight into Jain monastic life. But it was on the recommendations of George Grierson, the Irish Indologist who directed the Linguistic Survey of India, that he was actually appointed by the India office to work on the Bardic Chronicles of Rajputana. These had been collected by the Asiatic Society of Bengal, so that is where Tessitori arrived in 1914. Uh, he soon realized that these uh, you know, chronicles in the collection were actually very poorly copied manuscripts. So he proceeded to Jodhpur to actually begin a field survey for such manuscripts. As it so happened, uh, in 1916, because of the Great War, his funds for the project were halved. By then, he was relatively well known, so John Marshall stepped in and said that he would make up the difference, provided that while he scouted Bikaner for manuscripts, he also extensively searched out antiquarian remains for the ASI. Now, Bikaner was perhaps of all the states in Rajputana, the one in which conditions for archaeological exploration were most unfavorable. Uh, the distance between one village and another, the vast tracts of loose sand, uh, impervious to all means of conveyance except the camel, these are some of the conditions that Tessitori talks about. But I think this was compensated by the discovery especially in the northern part of Bikaner, of a very interesting archaeological field. On the banks of the Ghaggar, Tessitori documented a large number of mounds, of which Kalibanga is the one which is of intrinsic interest to this story. So Tessitori visited it in 1917, and he then went on to excavate it in 1918. He says in uh, some unpublished reports that he felt he had discovered vestiges, and I quote, of a very remote, if not prehistoric, antiquity. Uh, you can see here that he had discovered what is clearly a Harappan well, the remains of houses. He also uh, found a large number of objects which are typically Harappan, including terracotta cakes and perforated pottery. But what he did not mention in this report, but which he had found at the site, were long stone blades, which you see on the right side, and uh, seals. Seals which were practically identical to the ones from Harappa. Now, this juxtaposition of artifacts, that is, seals with stone blades and pottery, this is exactly what Alexander Cunningham, the first director general of the ASI, had found in his excavations of Harappa in 1871. He didn't understand the significance of what he had found. But surely, if Tessitori had drawn John Marshall's attention to what he had found in Kalibanga, I think it would have taken Marshall less than 10 minutes to realize that this was a new type of culture that actually stretched from Harappa to Kalibanga. So how is it that this did not become public knowledge? It's possible that uh, Tessitori decided to keep discreetly silent until he had sorted out the age and context for himself. This is typically what all of us do. You know, you don't want to sound stupid. So you kind of, and he was a linguist after all. He wasn't even trained as an archaeologist. Uh, it's also possible that he was going to, at some point, draw John Marshall's attention to this because uh, very soon after this excavation, his mother fell ill. And by the time he goes back to Udine, she has passed away. But he decides to spend some time at home. And at that point in time, he writes a letter to George Grierson, the man who was instrumental in getting him a job in India. And he says that, look, I found these seals. And he sends him the photographs. So Grierson is very excited. And he says, look, these look like 
you know, Chinese writing, to which, of course, uh, Tessitore says, no, it, this is not, you know, these are not bone inscriptions with Chinese writing. So Grierson tells him that you should actually write to John Marshall, get his permission, and publish this in the journal of the Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain and Ireland. And I think Tessitore might well have done that. But a very unfortunate set of events soon undertook and you know, took him away, actually. Because on his way back on the ship, he contracted double pneumonia. And by the time he reached Bikaner, within a few weeks, he passed away. So I think he is a forerunner in this whole discovery of the Indus civilization. But until I actually found these letters and reports, uh, I personally had no clue about this. Even today, actually, many scholars gather around his grave in Bikaner. That's where he is buried. And many of them are uh, scholars of languages. And they remember the contribution that he made to philological scholarship. But I think not many remember that this was a very unforeseen ending <coughs> to the beginning of what could have been a major tryst with things Harappan. Because when he was buried at Bikaner, the knowledge of the Kalibanga seals was also buried with him. So now to return to Dayaram Sahni and his excavation of Harappa. This, is, uh, this begins in January 1921. And what I've tried to highlight earlier is that Sahni's excavation was actually the result of a process that had begun to unfold as early as 1907. In fact, it's quite uh, clear that Sahni did not go to excavate Harappa because he was interested in it. It's just that within a week of taking over uh, you know, from Harold Hargreaves in the Northern Circle, he was sent by Marshall to inspect the site. Of course, it was Sahni, not Marshall, who did excavate it. And it is this excavation which led to a realization that the Harappa seals belonged to a time period that goes beyond uh, Alexander's invasion, which till that point in time used to form the sheet anchor of Indian chronology. And tentatively, both Sahni and Marshall were talking about a 1000 BC date. Uh, in a very guarded but optimistic assessment, Marshall also mentioned that there were 50 feet of unexcavated deposit below what had now been revealed, so the dates could well be earlier. But the point is that even in 1921, the momentous nature of Harappa had only very tentatively formed in the minds of those archaeologists who were aware that this was a very old city. But soon after this, there was an unexpected breakthrough. Uh, the cast of characters now becomes wider. And to understand how this unfolded, we have to move from Harappa in the Punjab to Mohenjo-daro in Sindh, which is some 500 kilometers away. Now, unlike Harappa, there was no slow hunch, nor even a prior understanding that the excavations of Mohenjo-daro would yield dramatic evidence. Uh, those excavations had nothing to do with Marshall's planning either. It was an officer of the Western Circle, Rakhal Das Banerjee, who for many years had been keen to excavate it. This is the official photograph of Banerjee clutching a pot from Mohenjo-daro. But uh, you know, when he went to Mohenjo-daro, he believed that it was a Buddhist site. This is because the citadel of Mohenjo-daro is actually crowned with a Buddhist stupa. So he's heading to Buddhist Mohenjo-daro, concentrating immediately on the stupa mound. Of course, it was in the course of clearing debris below the eastern retaining wall of the platform on which the stupa is that very unexpectedly one of his assistants made the momentous discovery of two inscribed seals. Banerjee immediately, of course, realized, unlike Tessitore, he was an archaeologist. 
So he realized that these were inscribed with characters that were very similar to the Harappa seals. But Mohenjo-daro was hundreds of kilometers to the southwest of Harappa. And it certainly meant that Harappa was not unique, but what was being revealed was an unknown, distinctive culture. So it was this that he had found and recognized seals of a Harappa type, which would later become the reason why, in the story of the discovery of the Indus civilization, he would always be considered a very important protagonist. For the moment, though, it was some three months after the seals were found that Banerjee, in March 1923, actually decided to touch base with his boss, Marshall. Uh, Marshall, when he, his attention was drawn to the seals, was very excited. And he told him that you should try and establish the uh, chronology of Mohenjo-daro and to try and see if it could actually be pushed back to 1000 BC, as he seemed to think Harappa could be. He uh, advised Marshall, uh, he advised uh, Banerjee to also try to see the cultural connections of the people who had produced these seals. Marshall himself couldn't do very much because uh, he was leaving for England on long leave in April. Now, in the world of science, it's fairly commonplace to speak of discovery being a consequence of a chance finding or an unexpected occurrence. This is exactly what happened in Banerjee's case. However, I think a lot depends upon the concerned researcher, whether the concerned researcher can actually take advantage of what has been unexpectedly found. So while reading uh, the works of historians of science, the sense I got was that while well, scientists do build up experiments which turn up these very unexpected results, they then uh, you know, do all kinds of things with what they have found, uh, comparing it to data that has emerged from other experiments, uh, trying to make sense of it in terms of existing paradigms, but if the same unexpected results are uh, obtained, then you try and build up a new model or theory. Now, if this is juxtaposed with matters as they unfolded after the discovery of the seals, uh, I think it's quite evident that Banerjee was very hesitant to visualize a new framework. Uh, he searched for the cultural connections of these seal makers but he tried to fit them in to this theory of the early spread of races. Uh, it was the kind of pigeonholing exercise which was very common uh, within uh, the British historiographic tradition on India, uh, where you had a paradigm uh, that considered India's ancient past primarily in terms of races and civilizations being brought into India. So the man from Mohenjo-daro, to put it another way, was thinking of the discovery in terms of a framework that was unlikely to lead to a new way of visualizing this unknown culture. Now, that is with regard to Banerjee, his discovery and his limitations. But what about Marshall? Now, interestingly, Marshall, on his return to India later that year, did not visit either Mohenjo-daro or Harappa. He instead proceeded to Taxila, the city that he excavated for over two decades. Of course, in this he was following routine. But my own sense is that this was an extraordinary field season. It was on his instructions that in 1923-24, uh, Harappa and Mohenjo-daro were being trenched in quick succession. Uh, but I don't think he wanted to break routine to get a first-hand glimpse of the excavations. If he had done that, it's possible that the discovery of the Indus civilization would have unfolded sooner than the autumn of 1924. So what eventually pushed Marshall to try and come to grips with the enigma of these two sites uh, were the connections that one of his junior officers, Madhav Swarup Watts, wrote to him about in April 1924. Uh, 
Madhya Sarup had just completed a four-week season of excavations at Mohenjo-daro. And it was he who first pointed out the similarities that existed between the two sites, the fact that these similarities went beyond seals. So the similarity in, let's say, the uh, you know, flint scrapers, the fact that bricks of the same size were used at Mohenjo-daro and Harappa, uh, the knowledge that actually the terracotta art uh, was of a kindred kind, all this is mentioned by Watts in his letter to the director general. This ability to articulate very simply uh, the various congruences that had entirely escaped the most senior archaeologists who had worked on Harappa and Mohenjo-daro is what makes Watts's letter an audacious intervention. It was marked by a boldness to stick his neck out by juxtaposing the two sites and suggesting that they were in the presence of a parallelism that ranged across an entire gamut of material culture. Marshall had neither seen Mohenjo-daro nor Harappa, but that summer, Watts's letter forced him to break routine and to begin coming to grips with the riddle that the relics of these two cities had thrown up. Now, Marshall reckoned that the only way to come to grips with the situation was by simultaneously comparing the material in conference with those who had worked there. So he quickly decided that there would be a conclave of archaeologists and artifacts which would assemble in Shimla, which was the summer capital of British India, and where his own head office was located. So when people ask me where was the Indus civilization discovered, I always say that it was really in Shimla. So by June, you have masses of material uh, reaching Shimla, and the task of comparing and correlating uh, the collections began. I think for the men assembled there, this must have been the most exciting archaeological examination of their lives. Uh, the painted and plain pottery, the chert knives, the seals, the stone beads, and so much else, uh, you know, of, from the two sides was strikingly similar. And the only person who until now had articulated the overarching archaeological identity was Watts. But now surveying the similarities for himself, uh, for Marshall, was different from reading about them. For many years, he had pondered the possibility of antiquarian remains of the Bronze Age. Now, unexpectedly, his officers had reclaimed a Bronze Age civilization. They had reclaimed it from under the alluvium of the Indus Plains, where it had been waiting, as it were, to script a new story. That it was a meeting of archaeologists in the company of artifacts and antiquities, which resulted in this recognition, I think is worth pondering over. Uh, among scientists, laboratory meetings are very common. And that's where data are presented. There's a whole lot of brainstorming. You're often made to sort of think of things differently, consider other data, other theories. And you know, this, this is really a good practice. But if you think of the ASI of colonial India, there was actually no institutional space where archaeologists uh, associated with sites discussed their digs or sought information from each other. For instance, it's very unlikely that Sahani and Banerjee visited Harappa and Mohenjo-daro in each other's company or that they had mutually discussed their findings. What was common to both of them was the figure of Marshall uh, to whom they addressed letters and queries. So there was no tradition at all of face-to-face -face brainstorming. If there had, on the other hand, been a mechanism which allowed ideas to converge and collide, possibly the flow of information and inspiration uh, would have been far faster. So it's not fortuitous that it was a big meeting of minds and matter in Shimla in the summer of 1924 that the enormity of what had been discovered was first understood. And I finally want to end by drawing your attention to another similar 
kind of networking of knowledge. Uh, this is immediately after Marshall's announcement in the Illustrated London News. This is 20th September 1924. In England, there were scholarly readers of this issue of the Illustrated London News who reacted instantaneously. Among them was the venerable linguist H. Sayes who immediately dashed off a note which appeared one week later on 27 September in the Illustrated London News. There he wrote that the finds were even more remarkable and startling than what Marshall had supposed. While Marshall's dating was provisional and did not go beyond the first millennium BC, it was Sayes who pointed out that seals of this type had been discovered in Susa in a context of the third millennium BCE. As Sayes put it, he says, it's evident therefore that as far back as the third millennium BCE, there was intercourse between Susa and northwest of India. The discovery opens up a new historical vista and it is likely to revolutionize our ideas of the age and origin of the Indian civilization. So in this way, the discovery of the Indus, uh, the announcement that is, led immediately to the unexpected uncovering of an entirely new temporal dimension for uh, the civilization. And clearly, this was because it had appeared in a widely read publication. And importantly, it was read by scholars with experience in matters of ancient scripts and sites in Asia. So the networking of knowledge in London appears to have been as crucial as it had been in Shimla. In conclusion then, in reflecting on the discovery of the Indus civilization, in relation to the more general question about whether the process was similar to the trajectory of scientific breakthroughs, or if it was qualitatively different, the answer would be that it was a little of both. On the one hand, there is a consonance in the sense that the Indus discovery, like some other major scientific developments, was long in the making. The slow evolution of a hunch that fructified into a major breakthrough. There is also a way in which in both processes, one can recognize the significance of an unexpected discovery and the crucial role of networks in producing new insights. On the other hand, in this case of how a forgotten civilization was unearthed in India, there were material circumstances that were specific to it. These were connected with the nature of institutional archeological research in a colony and the challenges that it faced because of government priorities and constraints. Marshall's was a slow hunch, but the pace of work in a government department of archaeology was also slow. Uh, along with this, there was a lack of an institutional interaction apart from the problems faced by the ASI as it grappled with shoestring budgets, retrenchments, even the consequences of a war on another continent to which India was connected by colonial ties. It is such elements of the material context in which discoveries unfold that I think would make the comparison of archeological breakthroughs with the histories of scientific discoveries an important area of future analysis. Thank you. Our first commentator is, uh, thank you, thank you. Our first commentator is Tamara Ching. Uh, she's uh, currently Associate Professor of Comparative Literature here at Brown, and came to Brown in 2014 after ser serving at the University of Chicago um, as an assistant professor. Um, she got her bachelor's degree from Harvard uh, College in classics and literature and then uh, took a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, in comparative literature. Her uh, most recent book is Savage Exchange, 
Han imperialism, Chinese literary style, and the economic imagination, published by Harvard uh, University Press in 2014. Thank you very much uh, to the Center for Contemporary South Asia and to um, Professor Lehri for uh, uh, the paper. Um, let me first of all set up the PowerPoint. Um, Sorry. Yeah, I just <laughs> yeah. This is it. Yeah. Yes. That's it. Oh, yeah, that is yeah. it. Thank so you very much. Just... Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so, again, uh, thank you to Professor Larry for um, such a fascinating paper. Um, when I first, can you hear me? Yeah. When I first read this paper, um, I'd recently come back from an annual lecture event at uh, Columbia that each year brings to the US the archaeological team whose discovery is selected as China's top archaeological discovery. I should emphasize that I'm a literary scholar, not an archaeologist or scientist, um, but Chinese archaeology is transforming the entire field of early China studies. That is, archaeologists are both expanding the literary and uh, cultural archive, and they're also reshaping reading and interpretive practices. Now, luckily for me, the top pick of this year happened to be right in my period around that second century BCE, which is unusual given the general preference for discoveries from the prehistoric, Paleolithic, and Neolithic periods. This trend can be seen in a hallmark state publication that's related to the annual competition um, that's here, uh, the 20th Century China's 100 Major Archaeological Discoveries, published around 2002. As you can see, what counts as a major discovery has a tendency to fall over 2,000 years ago, with a heavy weighting towards discoveries from over 3,000 years ago. That's the prehistoric and uh, uh, Shangta Han dynasties. Uh, and these, for some, basically help to attest uh, China's longevity. And that's, that's the thrust uh, of this point. Um, the publication coincided with a late 20th century uh, state chronology project, uh, uh, the Xiaoshangzhou chronology project, that aimed to scientifically date China's earliest dynasties. What was apparently new this year in the top 10 discoveries uh, competition was the participation of the general public in adding their vote. China's Bureau of Cultural Relics and the State Archaeological Society um, run the broad uh, run the uh, competition and uh, the broad criteria include that they set include the need for historical scientific artistic uh, value and for the provision of new information and understanding and I'm not actually sure where the popular vote actually fitted in but the weighting towards the prehistoric and the relationship between the academic the state and the popular raises an initial question that has to do with what determines or constitutes a major versus minor archaeological discovery, which, which is the breakthrough, and where do we start thinking about the breakthrough. Um, in the analysis of these discoveries, um, uh, some have broken down the selection of uh, sites uh, of archaeological discovery into three types. And as a non-archaeologist, I don't, I don't know whether this is a, 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 a normative set. But in the, in the China's case of, of, of the 20th century, 31% were accidental discoveries. Um, so the most well-known example is the uh, discovery by, a, uh, uh, by some farmers of the first emperor of Qin, Qin Shi Huangdi's tomb of terracotta armies. 10% were rescue or salvage archaeology, the Three Gorges Dam, the discoveries um, uh, that came from that. And 51% come from academic initiative. Um, what constitutes a scientific archaeology of the kind worth comparing is raised by this particular breakdown, I think. Um, and uh, I'll come to this uh, with my main comparison uh, in a minute. Uh, within China, as many of you know, um, modern archaeology, uh, modern scientific archaeology, um, is traditionally understood as having entered China through uh, the 1920s with the collaborations uh, highlighted here of the Swedish archaeologist um, Johan Gunnar Andersen 
And this has been differentiated from the historical uh, study of bronze and stone inscriptions in China on the one hand, epigraphy, and a long attested practice of tomb robbery. Um, and uh, Anderson is generally um, credited as discovering uh, prehistoric China. And you'll, and you'll notice the date here, 1921 uh, versus 1924 of Marshall. Um, as with um, Marshall, it, uh, and you can see from his um, uh, publication, uh, An Early Chinese Culture, this is uh, Anderson again, what he tries to do is, um, in, in, original, uh, in his original interest, is to tie the, uh, the extension of Chinese history into prehistory into an account of Western influence or uh, Western origins. And in this case, he's comparing um, painted pottery shards that were discovered in Yangshao culture, this Neolithic site in Henan, with um, Anao and um, a, 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 a site to the west, and um, uh, Tripolia in um, Russian Central Asia. And the original publicity around this was uh, headlined as uh, China's tie to the West, uh, not the longevity of China um, as, uh, as, the, as being what, he, what was being uh, uh, discovered. And again, the kind of ways in which this is written about, and I'm, I'm sure um, uh, archaeologists or, uh, and, and historians and uh, Professor Lehman already know this, what I wanted to emphasize is how this supports and parallels the kind of com complicated model of discovery of something uh, prehistoric origins while looking for something else that is Western origins. And in a sort of, uh, there's a sort of complicated collective endeavor that involves both locals and, uh, uh, and the European. And in the case of Oral Stein, which is a better known uh, uh, example that um, uh, is also raised by uh, 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 Professor Lehrer in, in, in her work, uh, excuse me, again, the interest for uh, Stein was in narrating the discovery as one about pushing the influence of uh, Greco-Roman culture uh, a little fit, bit further east, that extra inch beyond India into China. And for those of you who've read the archaeological reports by uh, German, French, uh, Swedish, uh, and, and British explorers uh, into the Silk, along the Silk Road, that was very much the narrative uh, at stake. And as you can just see here, um, this, or in Oral Stein's uh, 1912 publication uh, <coughs> concerning his uh, 1906 to 8 uh, second expedition to Central Asia. He says, the story of how he secured here 24 cases heavy with manuscript treasures, um, rescued from that strange place of hiding. This is in uh, Dunhuang in Gansu province in Western China, and five more filled with painting and so forth. Uh, and remains of Buddhist art has been characterized by a competent observer as a particularly dramatic and fruitful incident in the history of archaeological discovery. Um, faithful reproductions are here, and they make it easy for us to appreciate the artistic values of these finds and to recognize how the influence of Greco-Buddhist models victoriously spread to the Far East. A new chapter may be said to have been opened in the history of Eastern art. Um, there is, in Stein's work, a slow hunch of, of, of Western influence. And again, the complication that Stein is not the first person there. He's not the first person to discover uh, the manuscripts. In 1879, a fellow Hungarian had already uh, uh, seen the, what he described as Indian uh, Buddhist art uh, at Dunhuang, and uh, a Taoist monk who lived there, uh, 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 Wang Yuanlu had already shown him a manuscript taken from the cave, cave number uh, 16 that I'll show you in a minute. And you can see some of the, 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 the scrolls that were taken out and, and placed in the cave next door to the, um, uh, next door to the cave library uh, that I'll talk about in a minute uh, 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 for now. But uh, again, there's a complexity in how we think about what is seen as a discovery. It's still listed as one of uh, China's 100 major discoveries of the 20th century, and which aspect of that is the actual discovery. Um, what was discovered and what the significance of this, um, of Dunhuang means for literary scholars, 
and for a lot of others, above and beyond the now outdated model of Greco-Buddhist, uh, um, of, of, of Hellenistic um, uh, forms uh, sort of penetrating the East, uh, has to do with the kinds of uh, scripts and languages, the polyglot, polyscriptic bilingual texts that were discovered uh, in the cave, tem uh, cave library, as it's called uh, it, at Dong Huang, tens of thousands of uh, texts and text fragments. Actually, more have been found and cataloged in Sanskrit than, than Chinese. And these are, uh, this is just a list of some of the other uh, languages and literatures there. And again, it's just the opening of the cave that has the significance and that is seen as a discovery. Um, but is this um, a scientific discovery, and, and how do we think about that in relationship to um, the model that's being uh, set up here? As uh, Professor Larry points out in uh, Finding Forgotten Cities and um, Marshalling the Past, Stein and Marshall's worlds intersected. Um, uh, both were part of the uh, uh, ASI, and at one point uh, around 1904, uh, Marshall asks Stein whether he can dig it at Nal uh, and thereby sort of push the chronology back of Baluchistan because he's already seen, as, as we just saw in the lecture, he's already seen um, uh, the photo from, uh, 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 of, of the pottery uh, from Nal. And so he goes to Stein and says, you know, can, can I dig? And, and Stein says no. Now, why does he say no? And why is Stein more successful in getting funding to go and dig at, um, at Dunhuang. Um, as you can see, the, the, the big discovery of the Dunhuang uh, uh, grottos is just two years later. He's already preparing by uh, 1904. But the bigger question of why Stein succeeded in funding has to do with um, his being valued as, excuse me, uh, as a scientific surveyor and cartographer at a time when Central Asia had not yet been fully mapped. And that was part of what he was doing, and perhaps we might think about vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, Marshall. Um, again, uh, and this is part of a question about how we conceptualize the invention and the, the scientific discoverer as an, an organizer or an interpreter, as someone who discovers new evidence versus someone who discovers new meaning or a new uh, visualization. Um, uh, Stein was a, a cartographer, a surveyor. Anderson, uh, the discoverer of prehistoric China, was uh, able to be financed and able to be accepted into uh, the Chinese context at the same time because he was part of the Swedish Geological Survey that had been hired by the Chinese uh, Geological Bureau to help China modernize their railways and to uh, 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 prospect for coal. So there are two different kinds of models or two, two different analogies that I want to end with. Um, one has to do with this um, discovery of the past being analogized to the kind of discovery of um, uh, in cartography and geology of, say, a new lake in Central Asia or a new coal deposit in Shanxi in, in China um, versus new way versus new ways of uh, visualizing or interpreting that past. And in your model, you show the different stages from you know, Cunningham through to, through to Marshall and, and, and about the different uh, uh, um, ways in which they all participate, but with Marshall as a kind of capstone. And what struck me as I was thinking about this, and again, I'm not a scientist or archaeologist, so again, I'm, I'm coming at, at the idea of discovery from a slightly different angle, is um, uh, what I thought about was your own work on long distance trade networks and your inter reinterpretation elsewhere of the um, reliance on, um, and I, I hope I'm getting this right, and please correct me if I'm not, the reliance on um, local raw materials as opposed to very long distance um, uh, uh, um, trade networks in the ways in which we interpret Harappan um, uh, 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 civilization. That is moving against a certain model that way back when was about um, a, a much larger tie with the Mediterranean. And it seems that 
if we can, my question has to do you know, with how we model the, the um, temporality of the discovery. Why is it that your um, intervention into how we, into you know, the, the, the theory of, of influence or, or connection, how is that not part of the temporality of the discovery if we think about the whole? And is that, how, how does that relate to, you know, the model of geological versus cartographic discovery that, um, um, that Stein and, uh, and Anderson were, were, for example, were, were going into uh, their uh, uh, archaeological uh, discoveries with? So thank you very much. That's okay. Thank you, Tamara, for your commentary. Uh, and the next commentator, the second commentator, is Yanis Hamilakis, uh, professor, Joukowsky family professor of archaeology. Before joining Brown in, um, in 2016, last year, he was, uh, for long years, uh, a professor of archaeology at the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom. His um, areas of research include materiality, multi-temporality, and politics of the past. He has um, um, 15 authored, edited, or co-edited books, including um, The Nation and Its Ruins, 2007, Oxford University Press. Archaeologies and the Senses, Human Experience, Memory, and Effect, uh, 2013, Cambridge University Press. And um, uh, something in the makings, The Social Lives of Ruins, his Stanford Lectures to be published soon, I, I think, by the Cambridge University Press. So, um, uh, Yanis, for the next 10 to 15 minutes, this, this audience is yours. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much for inviting me, um, and thank you for the wonderful paper, Professor Lahiri. So, uh, in this um, fascinating paper we just heard, Professor Lahiri encourages us to reflect on the nature of discovery in archaeology, emphasizing the importance of scholarly networks, the role of contingency and chance, the role of objects as actors, as um, things that have an impact on people, and also the impact of sociopolitical circumstances. She claimed that these discoveries um, happened through what Dan Barr has called distributed reasoning, through scholarly brainstorming, communication of finds and ideas, and through sharing of data. I take her narrative to argue against the notion of discoveries as the work of isolated, single-minded geniuses, which happen in unique, epiphany moments. I found her argument convincing and her plea for more research in this process of knowledge production important and worthwhile. Now in the next few minutes, um, however, I would like to pick up some of her threads and develop her argument further, perhaps towards directions that she might not necessarily um, you know, encourage or agree with or, or uh, welcome. <laughs> um, for a start, the main actor here, one of the main actors, John Marshall, um, was mentioned in the paper and uh, uh, as someone who has also worked in the Mediterranean. So that Mediterranean background deserves, I think, further comment. Indeed, it was under Arthur Evans in Knossos at the turn of the century that he received his field training, hence his early um, interpretation of some of the pottery found in India as Mycenaean, as we heard. But what I would argue is that the similarities between these two historical moments go much further. In Knossos, too, it was seal stones found by Evans in the flea market of Athens and thought to have come from Crete, which strengthened his belief of the archaeological importance of the island and convinced him that he should go to Crete and uh, pursue excavations there. Now, these seal stones were called by the local people Galopedres, which means milkstones, as they were worn by women uh, 
during uh, breastfeeding to facilitate lactation, to facilitate breastfeeding. Yet, unlike Marshall, Evans left his own accounts of the Gnosian discoveries, plenty of them, as well as a holistic narrative of what has been called the Minoan uh, civilization. In other words, mostly his own personal vision or perhaps ecstatic dream, which often has a loose connection with empirical data. It was this dream which himself materialized on the site of Knossos, casting um, reinforced concrete and producing at the same time 20th century ruins. Now in these photos you can see that some of the reconstructed in concrete columns were left broken, were left half made to evoke the idea of, of ruins. So he was producing ruins in uh, the beginning of the 20th century, um, at the same time, of course, imposing a specific material um, reality into the site he excavated. Just going to go back to this. So this is, um, this was, this is another kind of imperial ruins, perhaps, to recall Hans Toller here. Having worked in the, Balkan, uh, in, uh, in the Balkans as correspondent of the Manchester Guardian before Knossos in the late um, uh, 19th century, he also knew how to propagate his own narrative through the British press and through various popular media, including London Street News, of course, and propagating thus a canonical story of a wide hierarchical European civilization at a time when, um, when the multi-ethnic and multi-faith island of Crete itself was part of the Ottoman Empire in the middle of also a series of political uh, entanglements and concerns. So in fact, in this uh, postcard that comes from Crete and produced by a photographer, an Ottoman photographer, Ben Hadid, what you see uh, actually many interesting things, including the uh, observation tower built by Evans himself to observe the huge terrain of excavation and the hundreds of workmen working for him and under him. And of course, the regiment, the British regiment um, at Knossos and the hundreds of local workmen. But an alternative story of that discovery, and I put in very comments for a moment, uh, the alternative story of the Knossian discovery would reveal that, in fact, the site was known to local people and had been explored, excavated, and partially published by a local amateur archaeologist by the name of Minos Kalokirinos, who could not, of course, compete with the scholarly, media, financial, and political networks that Evans could command and mobilize. As in India, local archaeological contributions were and are sidelined in the dominant narratives in the history of archaeology. More importantly, however, the connection here is British Empire and colonialism in both cases. Evans was able to secure the rights to excavate at Knossos, not only because of his personal connections and access to networks and resources, but also because the island itself was at the time a protectorate, a protectorate of Western powers. Uh, it was carved up in zones of influence and zones of military occupation. The area around Knossos was occupied by the British Army at the time. Other parts were occupied by other Western powers. In fact, archaeological discoveries, even to the present day, mirror that zoning of the island and the different areas where different armies had actually occupied the island. It was in this colonial archaeological terrain that Marshall was trained before India. I would thus include Knossos and Evans in this network outlined to us uh, today by our speaker, a network made possible by that colonial order of the British Empire. But Professor Lahirsi's paper contains a subtle and important question which needs to be brought forward. In this wide network of scholarship where distributed reasoning seems to have been uh, the operational logic, is this network a flat network? a symmetrical one to recall that tour, or are there, sim are there subtle asymmetries resting on global, imperial, and colonial connections? 
While, as the paper shows, the important discoveries in Harappa and Mohenjo-daro carried out by archaeologists from India were instrumental in the scheme of the Indus Valley civilization, that broader narrative scheme, the connecting of the dots, was credited to Marshall. Even his Wikipedia page today reads, and I quote, he was responsible for the excavation that led to the discovery of Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, two of the main cities that uh, comprise the Indus Valley civilization, end of quotation. Now, the connecting of the dots here was made possible because of his success and participation in key nodes of that network, including Knossos, London, Cambridge, Oxford, the British, and the Ashmolean Museums in the UK. Indeed, some of these key nodes operate as what we can call redistribution points. After all, a historical moment, as we saw in this discovery, was the announcement of the scheme in the London Illustrated News in 1924, a publication which is also crucial for Arthur Evans and Knossos, along, of course, with London Times. But I want to problematize further the notion of archaeological discovery, which is central to our paper today. So far, we've been talking about scholars. And it is easy for us, perhaps, to produce a historical narrative of our disciplines as self-congratulatory, biographical, and even ancestral discourses, even ancestral worship, perhaps, with obvious political, genealogical, um, and other kind of consequences in the present. Now, I'm not suggesting that our speaker did that today, of course, but I'm just commenting that this is a well-known strategy in the histories of, of disciplines. But in what ways are we justified to talk about archaeological discoveries? In my own work, um, and for the last um, few years, I have been engaged in, and already been mentioned in a long-term project called the social life of ruins. Now, that project follows um, an exploration of the link between um, archaeology and national and colonial imagination. And the aim is to detect and understand human encounters with multi-temporal materiality prior to the development of the colonial and national grid, prior to the development of the modernist um, grid of knowledge and power, prior, that is, to the development of professionalized archaeology. Through the study of travel narratives uh, from the 15th to the 19th century, through the study of folk tales, of ethnographic sources, through the study also of, of practices, of material engagements and practices, of reuse, of recontextualization, some of the things we call spolia, for example, a fascinating picture emerges with wider implications. In short, while in many cases it was professional archaeologists who unearthed archaeological sites for the first time, it is clear that in many other, many other cases, sites, localities, and objects not only were known to pe local people and communities, but they were also the focus of extensive material engagements involving reuse, recontextualization, modification, exhibition, but also the production of narratives and stories. One we even call them production of archaeological interpretations. I have decided indeed to call these practices archaeological in order to valorize them and emphasize the need for their further understanding and study. These were in some ways pre-modern, pre-national, and pre-colonial archaeologies. Now, um, just as an example, I have here what we can call a spolio from um, the village of Trizina in the Peloponnese that I encountered in 2007. And it comes from a Roman cemetery. And of course, that Roman cemetery had been discovered well before the archaeologists in the 19th or the early centuries. And it was re-embedded in a house, exhibited with, as you can see, the work face, uh, facing artworks, and valorized for different purposes from the um, archaeological ones, the conventional modernist archaeological ones. These were also practices that often enact a different affective ontology, another relationship with temporality and materiality, akin to our own contemporary concerns with material agency, 
with vibrant matter to recall Jane Bennett, and with a nonlinear, even multi temporal understanding of time. In that sense, our archaeological discoveries may not be discoveries at all, or after all. I'm not, of course, denying that through our own technological and scientific apparatus, we have produced a wealth of knowledge, information, and ideas. Indeed, I'm making these apparatuses, um, I'm using them extensively myself in my, no my own excavations. What I'm suggesting, however, is that it is perhaps interesting and fruitful to understand our own modern psychological interventions with, ma with materiality as perhaps the latest, the most recent, in the long sequence of other archaeological renderings and interventions, each following its own ontology. These are interventions and renderings with a long history. In some ways, an archaeology of archaeology. And I want to leave you with a slide from my current, exca uh, current excavation project, where you can see, in fact, the archaeology of people before us. And this is a, a mound we have um, ex been excavating for the last few years. The main phase is uh, the Neolithic, and this uh, the seventh millennium BC, and these are the houses from the Neolithic. But progressively, we realized that, in fact, our site had been discovered at least two times before us in the past. First of all, by people in the Bronze Age, which they built a Tholos tomb next to Neolithic houses, perhaps using some of the material from the Neolithic houses. And for the second time in the 12th century AD, by medieval people who also buried their dead next to these Neolithic houses. So here are archaeological discoveries before our own archaeological discoveries. Thank you very much. So we have uh, 25 minutes for our discussion. And uh, before I invite uh, Professor Lahiri to respond to, to what Tamara and Yanis had to say, um, may, I, um, may I add uh, another question? Not as an archaeologist, of course, I'm not one. But, um, but a generic question about science. Um, it seems to me that one could talk about uh, scientific discoveries of two kinds. One would be a heliocentric view of the planetary system, which uh, a lot of people now argue Indians in the ancient times knew. But why does the Earth revolve around the sun? Um, I think we began to understand this only with the Copernicus uh, revolution of the 16th century when a model was proposed, and we began to, why this is so. So um, are, you, are you going to make a distinction between scientific discovery and scientific explanation um, um, and, and, st and see them as two analytically separable matters, and you're dealing with one, the A, which is scientific discovery, rather than a scientific explanation which has cause and effect built into it. Um, this is one. And the second, as I heard you about um, folk archaeologists and technical archaeologists and, and whose narrative won out, um, I was reminded of uh, Pierre Rivere by, by Foucault, where the story of the parricide, the killing of the father, mother, um, killing of a parent. What is it? Father, mother was killed. Yes. So there is a, the discussion um, is about about um, all kinds of narratives that could be produced, including by the murderer, the son who murdered, um, the county clerk, the um, the local um, other local administrations, and the narrative, the explanation of what happened, the the explanation that won out in the end was the one that Parisians supported, not the local supporter. And so the question of power sure. got involved in, in the legitimation of the right narrative 
or the correct narrative for understanding what happened. Um, uh, and Foucault, of course, is known for explaining how power and knowledge get into inter interlinked. But is there any such story in uh, Harappa or Mohenjo-daro? I'm not sure, uh, this, uh, but it's, it's a question worth posing. Uh, whether whether uh, Marshall is winning because of this reason or something else. <clears throat> so very quickly to uh, answer some of the questions that were raised and then, you know, to open this uh, up. First of all, thank you uh, very much, uh, Tamara Chin and Yanis Hamilatis. You've really... Uh, you know, made me think of a whole lot of issues connected with uh, the question of discoveries in relation to the areas you work with, uh, but also other things. Uh, I was, for instance, uh, Tamara, very struck by uh, the question, you know, the statistics that you showed about excavations in China. And if one was to just juxtapose this with uh, what is the situation in India. So in India, we still do not have regular salvage archaeology. This is something I will talk about on Monday. So for example, uh, if you have metro lines that are going to be built, or you have uh, you know, large tracts of land which are given to uh, for industrial initiatives. There is nothing built into the contracts which puts a percentage of uh, the project as, you know, it, as mandatorily having to be you know, used for uh, working on uh, those lands. And that if something is found, then through contract archaeology, uh, you know, that is uh, examined. On the question of, uh, you know, this whole theory of influence which you raised, that you know, in my own work, I've sort of talked about local raw materials as against long distance trade networks. And you know, if one was to look at uh, the Indus and the discovery of the Indus, and uh, you know, your, the quotation that you highlighted sort of made out um, you know, Mycenae and to be very important, the quotation from Marshall, you know, from the Illustrated uh, London News. Uh, I want to say here uh, two things about the discovery. I think when the discovery was made, because there was no, there were no scientific ways of working out dates, so the dating had to be done through cross-cultural, you know, uh, comparisons. There's absolutely no question about it. So. Uh, the, you know, the excitement of Marshall with what uh, Says wrote about, or later Gad and Sidney Smith uh, mentioned, or Mackay. I mean, this is really very important because it's the only way in which there could be uh, secure dating for the Indus civilization. The other point, however, which I think because, you know, there's only that much that you can mention in an academic lecture, uh, which I think is very important. If you look at Marshall's description of the discovery of the Indus civilization and what was after that published in November 1924 in the Indian newspapers, but this is also true for the Illustrated London News uh, announcement, it is actually the fact that this civilization is seriously rooted in the soil of India that he constantly highlights. It's a very uncolonial thing to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, 1924, mm -hmm. you know, you're thinking about, I mean, you know, Gandhi and the national movement, which, uh, you know, they're doing reasonably well. And for this guy to be then talking about, he wasn't a Vincent Smith who was seeing this in terms of uh, influences from outside. He may well have been looking for the Mycenaean links of Nal in 1903, but by 1924, mm -hmm. if you read his description, it's completely different. Mm -hmm. There may, of course, have been, there might have been a strategic reason for this, which was that uh, around 1923, the budget, again, for the archaeological survey had been seriously pared down. So uh, the 
this 1923-24 excavation was done with 10 or 12,000 rupees, a very small amount of money. And I think by talking about this great discovery, he was, you know, he was trying to get Indian pressure to build on the British Raj so that more money could be made available. That could also be uh, one reason. And he was very successful because uh, immediately, I think, 60,000 rupees were given, and then within a year, a few lakhs of rupees, and so the excavations went on for uh, a long time. Uh, so, I mean, as far as I look at Marshall's work, I, I find it really problematic to look at any, uh, you know, any scholar's work in terms of fixed things. So he may well have been thinking about the Mycenaean links in 1903, but by the time he has got his teeth into what has come out of Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, there's something very different. Just as when he published the Taxila reports, it's a different mindset of Marshall that you know, we are looking at. So I think it's interesting to you know, sort of disaggregate the work of scholars and not see them as you know, one thing uh, leading to another. Now, as far as uh, you know, your comments, uh, Professor, I mean, Lakis are concerned. I mean, I actually, uh, there are two points very quickly that I want to make about, uh, you know, whose discoveries are we talking about and who discovered them first. So, you know, I'm actually also very interested in living antiquarianism in India, exactly the sort of thing that you were talking about. And this is something, again, I will mention, uh, you know, on Monday. Uh, the fact that actually a lot of antiquities and artifacts survive because precisely of this kind of local engagement. Uh, but having said that, at the same time, there is a difference in looking at it as an integral part of your mythology and your beliefs and using objects which were created for something else entirely. That happens all the time in India. But to see these objects in terms of, you know, like, uh, you know, a person who is working with clues and trying to solve a mystery would do, which is what I was trying to draw attention to in talking about uh, the Indus discoveries. And for me, while the colonial angle is important and it's all there in my work, I think in looking at uh, you know, these frames and contexts, one should also not lose sight of the intellectual processes and the links that make these things uh, possible. For me, the fact that Alexander Cunningham excavated Harappa in 1871, but still thought it was a place which Xuan Sang had visited in the seventh century because he couldn't look beyond the literary spectacles with which he looked at you know, the past, the Indian past. I think, uh, you know, for me, you know, why is it that a particular kind of scholar can make certain kinds of connections and somebody else can't? I mean, for me, that's important. And that's why I looked at scientific discoveries mm -hmm. to see what scientists uh, do and so on. So for me, the excitement of the discovery and you know beyond just the frame and the context of uh, you know colonialism mm -hmm. is uh, you know it's pretty important ashutosh as for you know your question of science, i mean the issue of scientific discovery and looking at you know just the process the explanation is uh, uh, concerned i think it is explanations which you know, often one is uh, talking about. But the point in archaeology is that often, if you look at histories of discoveries, it's well, so-and-so went and excavated this and did this, and it's a very straightforward, uh, unproblematized uh, story. Whereas if you actually start going into the nitty gritty of things, as in the case of the Indus, it's possible to do this because there are just these mountains of files where things were obsessively uh, recorded. I think you find uh, you know, a different kind of narrative that can be uh, reconstructed, and that it's not the discovery of Harappa, which was actually discovered in the 19th century, which was important, 
but the manner in which, in fact, there is no great expansion in knowledge as far as 1920s is concerned. It's just a question of piecing together these little bits. And uh, the funny thing is that John Marshall did this without have, ever having visited Harappa and Mohenjo-daro. I mean, I found it really strange that somebody who's the Raja of the archaeological universe of India should not have gone to either Harappa or Mohenjo-daro before announcing it. He doesn't let on in the illustrated London news that he hasn't actually seen either of these sites. But from the files, you realize that he actually went there only in February 1925. But uncommon intuition, because much of what he wrote uh, and the connections he made, you know, those, those have stood the test of time. So it's He's like a Sherlock Holmes, you know, <laughs> sort of a little away from the excitement, you know, looking at things, trying to put them together. So it's a, it's a, it's a Copernican moment, there, right? You have a model <laughs> explaining why there is, there is this discovery of that, of the, of the Harappa civilization, you're saying, in 1870 or so, right? Or of even Harappa, earlier. only Harappa. Only Harappa. And then by 1920, you're beginning to get an explanation of why it would be this century and not that century, right? So there's an explanatory exercise, which is. There are also discoveries, because Mohenjo-daro is discovered, which shows that you're not looking at a unique site, but, but you're looking at a, at a culture which stretches which across 500, 500 kilometers. kilometers. So it's a combination of both. Let's uh, op open it up now. Wazira's hand is up. Wazira.
may push you to think about the scandal of discovery. And I was, I was specifically thinking scandal discovery needs to be all the time. And you, uh, Tamara, described him as sort of uh, a, a scientific explorer. But you know, in, in the Indian context, he was considered a sort of scandalous figure. Marshall really hated him and thought that he was using undue resources um, and was, you know, anyway, there was, there was a lot of, there was a lot of, um, uh, one could say, uh, a non, um, off the scientific register that one looked outside of um, uh, an arch a scientific archive um, for any of these discoveries. Uh, there are cases of um, a change upon uh, all of these materials uh, and the problems that are up on screen uh, emerge with stir and upload to the imagination as a, as a site of both scandal, humiliation, and lamenting, and as, as Juliana Sabua uh, shows in other contexts, um, the mobilization of many nationalisms uh, against uh, uh, local forms of knowledge. So, sorry for a long <laughs> but 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 in that day, the heart of so many kinds of questions, I um, uh, uh, wanted to pursue. Bigu, uh, let's turn to you now. Um, what I'll do is I'll leave about three four minutes for for Nanjo to respond. So let's see if we can take you and maybe one more question. Bigu. No 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 three three questions yeah sure. yeah yeah you you next. Bhrigu, I hate to interrupt you, no. but yeah, just four fifty six. So the Yes, please. Thank you. 
let me let me uh, um, we we are going to run over a little so so allow us an extra few minutes uh, the reception will begin i suppose not at 5 a little later so if, are, there, are there any other questions yes Let's, would you like to make some of sure. Yeah, very, very yeah. briefly, yeah. In some of the things we've been discussing. The first is to do with the status of the archive in the history of archaeology. Um, I understand what you've heard. is wonderful and important and fascinating, but perhaps we have to problematize that as well, you know, given the whole discussion, as you know, in the kind of the role of the archive. Um, you know, let's think about, you know, Peridas' discussion about it or Stoller's discussion about the seat of the archive. That is an institution that is actually embedded within the whole order we're trying to uncover. So I think, in addition to that, which needs to be, of course, you know, made use of extensively along and against the grain of the archive, let's think about the oral histories of archaeology as well as the local histories of archaeology. I mean, you saw the slides, there are hundreds and hundreds of people who participate in the production of archaeology. <coughs> These voices are rarely heard because nobody actually bothered to ask these workmen in the hundreds, what do they think about the whole process of archaeological discovery or not? So these are important, I think, sources of knowledge for us. The second very, very uh, brief point is... What do you call these people in your, in your work? Folk, folk uh, no, archaeologists? Or no, I call them ethnographic interlocutors. In ethnographic <laughs> interlocutors. Good to know the term, yes. <laughs> okay. the Collaborators, when yeah. we dig together and okay. when we just interview. Anyway, the second point is to do with colonialism. I mean, I, my understanding of it is not so much, you know, of course, the political process in the macro scale, but also let's think about it as a, as a, an a bod bodily process. And I was, I was, I was thinking of that quotation in the film about sewage, how in this civilization we found civilization with organized sewage. It's exactly the same quotation you see in in guides about Knossos even today. So what is actually for granted is that ability of that old civilization to have sewages. So think of it in terms of implications, in terms of the body, the Europeanization, whiteness as well. All these issues, I think, come together in the order of what I call colonial order. London didn't have sewage for all of the citizens until 1903. <laughs> Paris didn't have sewage for all of its citizens until 1931. But what does it mean that we pay so much right. attention so to? So we, this? you can, <laughs> if you can't provide <laughs> sewage to all of your citizens in London, maybe sewage in it's ancient times has a, has a great deal of, of, course. of, of We don't value. even know if Knossos has sewage. That's what I've ever right. thought. Right. <laughs> Tamara, would you like to make a few comments? No, no. Okay. Mm. Nanjo. <laughs> So on the question of sewage, I just want to say that the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan of uh, the Prime Minister of India today also often yes. refers to it's the great, addition. you know, sewage system that of we had. The yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you go to the, uh, you know, the Sulab Museum, which is near uh, the airport, mm. you do have the Indus civilization evoked there too in the bathrooms that are on display. So it's, it's mm -hmm. not just mattered to the colonials, but you know, it, it matters to a whole lot of people um, even today. Uh, you know, the second point about ethnographic interlocutors, I mean, this is actually very important. Uh, many years ago, I did a field survey of what is uh, part of, or used to be a part of the Faridabad district. And uh, this was, if you, it, it's, as you move from Delhi to Agra, you will only see factory installations on the way. But if you just go behind those factory installations, there's a whole rural universe. And I did a, you know, feed, a sort of village to village survey. And many things that were discovered could not have been discovered without ethnographic mm -hmm. interlocutors. Mm -hmm. And because they have integrated a whole lot of broken sculpture, mm -hmm. 
uh, architectural elements, etc., in their folk worship. So, I mean, I completely uh, agree with you. And, and you know, it was a complete relearning process mm -hmm. because if you look at textual knowledge, religious knowledge, you're not supposed to worship broken images, but nobody feels tyrannized by textual knowledge, you know, in villages, and they do exactly what they feel like and more, uh, you know, power sure. to them. Now, as far as uh, Brigupati, what, you know, you had mentioned, uh, well, as far as I'm concerned, I had read, and as a school kid, and probably you too did, that the Indus civilization was discovered when Dayaram Sahani went and excavated Harappa and uh, Rakhal Das Banerjee excavated Mohenjo-daro. That's the way it was understood, but that's not the story. There is really so much more to it, which, when you go into the details, tells you something about how archaeological discoveries can happen. And what made the story very interesting for me was the fact that there wasn't a hero here. There are all these characters and doing their own things, and eventually some of it comes together, some of it doesn't. Tessitori's knowledge of Kalibanga dies uh, you know, with him, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So for me, it was really a homage, I would say, to that. I mean, I agree that you would like to see it you know within larger frames and how it fits in with this or that but you know when you have discovered sources which were unknown the question is whether you want to actually put them out there for other people to know about and the indus uh, ought to be told i mean this was a story in which there were indians there was an italian who was neither a part of the colonial you know, Raj or an Indian. And then, of course, there were the colonials, including Marshall, who was quite uncolonial in the way he thought about the Indus civilization. So I thought it was a good story to tell. And I still feel that people read history uh, in India, and this must be true for many parts of the world, not for theory, but for learning and looking at, you know, how things happened. So the history of the discovery involves uh, excavating and describing the discovery in all its details and so on and so forth. And that's what I chose. I, I chose to do narrative history. So it was, you know, it's a choice that I have made. I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a theoretician. And I mean, there is, you know, for me, that really uh, is something that I, I don't feel qualified to talk about. Which brings me to uh, you know your question on the larger colonial frame and the scandal of archaeology and so on and so forth. I stopped at 1924, and uh, let me say here though that and this is just you know we think about the Indus being politically used by people on the right side of the political spectrum. But as a matter of fact, some of the most important archaeological discoveries relating to the Indus civilization post-independence, immediately post-independence, happened because of Prime Minister Nehru. Uh, it happened because Sardar Panikkar, who was the Diwan of Bikaner, just before, a month before he had to take over as the ambassador to China, wrote a letter to Nehru saying that he had met Oral Stein. And over you know, several meetings, Stein had told him about some of his own work in the Ghagar Hakra area, and that there were sites there which were like Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, and that you know, this new state of India should do something about it. In less than a day, and clearly Nehru had a lot to do in 1948-49 without getting into all this, but in less than a day, uh, you know, his private secretary wrote to the Minister of Education. He, the Minister of Education got the ASI to uh, give a project. The Finance Ministry was not willing to give the money. Uh, it went back and forth. Nehru had to intervene again. And this is how uh, uh, you know, Kalibanga, Lothal, a whole lot of other sites. It's one of the big success stories of Indian archaeology, which happens in the Nehruvian uh, era. And, uh, the fact that a lot of people took pride in the fact that the Indus civilization was not just a Pakistan phenomenon, but was also rooted in the soil of India, you know, is something that comes out of it. So the political aspects and so on and so forth I've discussed elsewhere, which is why I didn't bring them up here.
here in any great detail, and I stopped at 24. Your question was about medicine, right? It was about documentation. So yeah. Published? Yes, on the question of where it was to be published, I think my, my academic sense is that Marshall's was a right choice. Because it was, you see, if you look at the aftermath of the publication, within one week, you have a letter from a person who works on West Asia, who spent many years looking at West Asian inscriptions, responding and showing. I mean, he's the one who actually gives it a third millennium BC chronology. And within a week after that, you have another uh, set of West, West Asian specialists writing. So I think it was important to publish it in a place where he himself in his writing says that, look, we don't know a lot about this. We don't know the links. And I want you know, people to uh, tell me more about this. And that's, I, as far as I'm concerned, it was a very good choice. Um, I bring us to um, an end with two announcement, announcements. One, uh, that the lecture on Monday is at 5 o'clock here. And the title is, uh, that's the, sec uh, the second of the two lec uh, lectures, At the Crossroads of Politics and Progress, India's Archaeological Heritage Since Independence. And second announcement is that we have the committee uh, at the center, steering committee has already decided that the next three Jinder lectures will be David Moss in the, in the, in the fall, Amitav Ghosh next spring, and Raghuram Rajan in the fall of 20. 18. Um, so it's time now to thank, uh, thank Nanjot, uh, Tamara, and Yanis for a wonderful two hours that we've spent with them.